This evening we are continuing on uh, in our series in religions and cults, having finished off Hinduism last time. Um, by finished off, I don't mean by any stretch of the imagination we have exhaustively looked at and explored. Um, this is definitely a summary style um, series that we're going through on a Wednesday night. Now, as we start our study tonight, um, I just want to uh, confirm that what I'm doing tonight, the, the topic that I'm preaching on tonight is not to do with uh, a response to anything that's been taking place in the Middle East or in Sydney last weekend. Um, when I set off to start this series on religions and cults, um, I had a plan of the first three that I was going to do. And the idea was start to work your way in towards the religion of Christianity. And so it just so happens to be relevant uh, what we're studying tonight. Let's pray and then we'll begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can, Lord, come together and consider uh, some of these things that are so relevant, Lord, uh, for the world in which we live. Uh, Lord, for we who are Christians, Lord, in trying to live out our faith, in trying to uh, have a religion, Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand, Lord, the, the truths and the differences uh, between us and others. And we pray, Lord, that as people are talking about religious people and, and the problems with religion, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see uh, that religion is not just religion. Uh, people believe very different things. And I pray that we would be informed and armed, Lord, as we think about some of these things tonight. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we usually do, uh, going through our studies, uh, we'll take one study to set forth um, the belief system, and then we'll take our next study to come back and critique that from a biblical standpoint. So tonight, we're going to have a look at the religion of Islam. Once I turn my pointer on. Now we're ready. In the religions that we've been categorizing so far, we've been looking at atheistic religions, monotheistic religions, and polytheistic religions. Um, we've placed Buddhism under the belief in no God. That, not that that means that Buddhists all believe that there is no God, but, but um, the belief in a God is not necessary for Buddhism. Hinduism, uh, we will remember, is a um, belief in many gods, often um, but the one we're going to look at tonight is the belief in one God called Islam. Just turn that fluoro off on the stage. A bit easier on the eyes? Great. <clears throat> Islam, unlike Buddhism and Hinduism, firmly and definitely fits under monotheism. There is no doubt there is no wiggle room. Islam is a monotheistic religion and it's only a monotheistic religion. The prevalence of Islam throughout the world, uh, I'm not sure whether some of these facts are going to surprise you tonight, but some of them surprised me. Currently, Islam accounts for around about 24% of the world's population. Is that surprising? Did you think it was more? Did you think it was less? Um, I think sometimes for the presence in the media, we might think that Islam accounts for more of the world's population than 24%, around about 1.9 to 2 million people. Muslim, Muslims are growing as a proportion of the population. They are the fast, it's the fastest growing religion in the world, Islam. Currently, Christianity is the largest religion in the world, the broad sense of defining Christianity. However, uh, it's anticipated by um, the Pew Research Center. Um, that sounds like a very Christian thing, but um, it, everyone quotes the Pew Research Center, whether it's Wikipedia or embassies or whatever, they all quote the Pew Research Center in relation to religion and their demographics. And what's interesting about Islam is that within Islam, the fertility rates, that is the estimated number of children per woman in those religions, 
In the world, it's 2.2 children per woman. In Islam, it's 2.9 children per woman. So what that means is that by about the year 2050, it's estimated that Islam will be the largest religion in the world, not necessarily because of conversions and people turning to Islam, because it's estimated that around about the same number of people are being converted to Islam as are leaving Islam. So there's no real net gain or loss there. Rather, um, in Islam, they're having a lot more children. That's just the simple facts of it. The distribution of the Muslim population throughout the world, um, as I mentioned before, this graphic refers to the percentage of the population of a country that is Muslim. So uh, it doesn't mean the most people, right? But you can see uh, there's a big concentration throughout Asia, throughout the Middle East, and throughout Northern Africa. But you can also see up here, Southeast Asia, specifically in Indonesia, that's not Bali, sorry, that's the wrong label that's from last time forget about that the um, map is what you need to be looking at there let me read to you what it says um, this was the pew research center's findings although many countries in the middle east north africa region where the religion originated in the seventh century are heavily muslim so it's speaking about this region in here The region is home to only about 20% of the world's Muslims. That surprised me. A majority of the Muslims globally, 62%, live in the Asia Pacific region. So the majority of Muslims live in this region here. Indonesia is currently the country with the world's largest Muslim population. But it's projected that India will have that distinction by the year 2050. Interestingly, India will have the largest Muslim population by 2050, if things can continue to go the way that they're going, but they will still be a minority. So there will be majority Hindu, minority Muslim, but it'll still be the largest population in the world. What does that tell you? India is a massive population of people. <laughs> it's huge. <clears throat> Let me show you a graphic here. Um, you probably can't read these numbers. I'm not expecting you to, but look at the pretty blue lines. Uh, the top 25 countries with the largest number of Muslims in 2022. So this is not just proportionate. This is actually the total. Top Indonesia, 241.5 million people. Pakistan is second, India third, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Egypt, Iran, Turkey, Ethiopia, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> is that what you expected to see? Indonesia top, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Egypt. What countries would you have expected to see there that are not there? Iraq's all the way down here. Iran's all the way down here. Um, Afghanistan, Morocco, all the way down here. Saudi Arabia, all the way down here. So a lot of countries that we think are the, the, the centers population-wise of Islam, it's not necessarily the case. Some quick facts about Islam. As we've been doing for each of the religions, uh, the area that it originated in is modern Saudi Arabia. It wasn't called Saudi Arabia at the time, but that's where it originated. The founder was the Prophet Muhammad. It was established in around about 610 AD. That is the date around which Muhammad uh, supposedly received his first revelation from the angel. And the category we were put into is firmly monotheist. You can't understand the religion of Islam unless you understand Muhammad. And so just to put a quick timeline together of Muhammad, what you will realize really quickly is that it's, it's a very short and a very geographically isolated story. Muhammad was born in a town called Mecca 
or maca, depending on how you pronounce it. A lot of the words are spelt differently in English a number of times because they're written in Arabic and translated across. So there's not direct letters sometimes for them, and the vowels are quite interchangeable depending on how you pronounce those words. He was born in around 570 AD. He received the first revelation from the angel Gabriel in 610 AD. He fled to Mecca, sorry, fled Mecca to Medina. He was preaching in Mecca and he had a powerful family there that was looking after him, powerful uncle. When they died or when they were no longer powerful, he had to leave because he was no longer safe from his, in his preaching. So he went to Medina. His following when he was in the town of Medina grew. He established what was called a theocracy, which is where God rules, um, but Muhammad was the only one who represented God. So it was a dictatorship, essentially, in Medina. He defended an attack from the Meccans who tried to come and conquer, um, probably because Muhammad had been raiding a lot of Meccan caravans as they were traveling through the area. And so the Meccans came and tried to defeat those at Medina, uh, Muhammad and all of his followers. After he defended that attack, he conquered a number of tribes and villages around the area. Some of those were Jewish towns. Some of them were other Arabs. In 630 AD, he was able to conquer the town of Mecca, which is going to be crucial in the establishment of Islam and its foundation, as we'll see in the modern worship of Islam. In 632, he died without an heir. So without a son, he died. Now, why is that important? Well, because the Islamic schools are only there because Muhammad died without a definite heir or a definite person to take over from him. So there are two major Islamic schools or two major branches of Islam in the world. One is the Sunni Muslims and the other are the Shia Muslims, Shiites and Sunnis. You, without knowing those names, you would have seen wars between them, even if you're not familiar with them being these two things. So the word Sunni is talking about tradition or being orthodox to the traditional teachings of what it was meant to be, what Islam was meant to be. They believe that Muhammad didn't designate a successor. So he didn't point someone out to take over from him when he died. The, the Sunni Muslims account for 87 to 90 percent of Muslims throughout the world. So the overwhelming majority of Muslims are Sunni Muslims. The Shiite Muslims the word Shiite comes, is an abbreviation of a full expression which means the party of Ali. Now, Ali was the fourth successor in the Sunni tradition. Okay, so there was one person who the Muslims got together and decided who's going to be the successor of Muhammad and they decided this person's going to be the successor. Then there was another one, then there was another one and then Ali was the fourth who came along. The Shiites believe that because he was the son-in-law of Muhammad, he was the only rightful successor. So they rejected all of the other people who tried to lead Muslims and they only believe that there is a rightful line of succession. They account for 10 to 13% of Muslims and they believe because of this um, line of descendants that their imams or their leaders are infallible. They teach that whatever those imams teach is direct revelation from God. They are largely, this is the Shiite stronghold of the world, Iran. So you will see, <laughs> um, not just because there's the Sunni Shiite distinction, but Saudi Arabia and Iran don't get on very well. This is one reason, because it's an ancient distinction between them. As with most major religions, 
Islam has its holy books. The one that we're most familiar with, we might call the Quran or the Quran. Um, we probably say it the same way, even though we probably stumble over these K's and Q's. But the Quran is the revelation of Allah, who is God, um, just the, the Arabic word for God, although many, is, many Muslims don't believe that the name God in English accurately captures all that Allah is meant to refer to. The Quran is the revelation of Allah to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. It was through revelations, direct revelations from the angel Gabriel to Muhammad that he supposedly found the will of God. There are 114 surahs in the Quran and they function a lot like our chapters in the Bible. So you can, they're, they're named a number of different things or sections of them are named different things, but um, I'll show you a quote from one a little bit later and it's just, it just looks like chapter and verse. It's got the same colon in between the numbers and everything. They were written down under the third successor of Muhammad and his name was Othman. He decided that nothing had been written down to this point officially. So he collected all of these things together and got one of his um, underlings to compile the official record of Muhammad's teaching. Now, this is really important because when they did that, they made five authoritative copies of the Quran. So they agreed, they all got together and agreed, this is the official record of what Muhammad said. And then they collected all of the other fragments and pieces and people's uh, witnesses about what he had said and they burned and destroyed them all. So everything except for the five approved copies of the Quran were destroyed with authority. So it's not just whatever was written at the time has been preserved. It was, let's all collectively decide these are the five copies that all say exactly the same things. This is what Muhammad said because we're going to get rid of everything else. Very different mode of origin to the Bible. Critically different. The other important writing in Islam is called the Sunnah. And because Muhammad is, he gives his example and his example is claimed to be a perfect example by Muhammad. <laughs> um, the Sunnah then is a collection of the way that Muhammad lived his life. It's not revelations from God, but it's all the things that Muhammad did in his life are collected in the Sunnah. So it's like a, an example of the prophet but the prophet happens to be perfect <clears throat> and muslims model their lives on the life of muhammad okay so you've got the divine revelation of what allah wanted muhammad to know and tell the world and then you've got muhammad's example and because muhammad was meant to be perfect then uh, muslims model their lives upon his life as well Islam is one of the three Abrahamic religions in the world. That is, they trace their origin back to Abraham, or back through Abraham. The other two, of course, being Christianity and Judaism. This is a quote. You can see down here the nature of the reference. You've got surah number two, and it's 136 in surah number two. You can even call them verses. This is what it says. Say, O believers, we believe in Allah and what has been revealed to us and what was revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob and his descendants and what was given to Moses, Jesus and other prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and to Allah we all submit. And so what they're teaching is that all of these people that are mentioned here, all the Old Testament prophets, even Jesus Christ, they were all Muslims and they all taught consistently with what uh, the Quran taught. Okay, now the, the trouble is 
if you pick up a Bible and you pick up the Quran and you compare them, they're not the same. Uh, what Abraham supposedly taught in the Quran and what Abraham taught in the Old Testament are not the same. Thus, the doctrine of biblical corruption in Islam is that all of the prophecies about Muhammad's coming that were in all of these prophets, the Jews and the Christians have removed them out of the Christian and Jewish books. So the doctrine of biblical corruption is that everything that was about Muhammad has been taken out intentionally by Christians and Jews. And the teaching of the Jews and the Christians that contradict Muhammad have been corrupted and changed from what they were originally. So their claim is that the Bible that you've got used to say what they believe, but now it's all being corrupted. So if, any, if your Bible differs in any way to what a Muslim believes, it's because your Bible has been corrupted. Because they claim all the same teachers that we would claim. So Islam is definitely an Abrahamic religion. But what do they actually believe? Now, what is it that a Muslim believes? We, we know what Muslims uh, have done, where they live, how many of them there are, but the five pillars really is where it's at for a Muslim. The five key parts to Islamic life. This is a mosque, by the way, that's over in the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi. Um, it's worth a look at some pictures. It's a pretty incredible building. The first of the five pillars is called the Shahada. It's the profession of faith. And this is the one that you probably would have heard quite a bit. There is no God but God. There is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his prophet. That's the confession. And this is the central belief and the central identity to being a Muslim is having this confession. If you believe that there is no God but Allah monotheist and you believe that muhammad is his prophet and his final prophet then you are a muslim interestingly everyone is born muslims and it's only by corruption that we are turned away from allah so there is no such thing as a convert to islam people are called reverts so if you go back to islam because you were born a muslim you have reverted to your original faith and Muhammad preached and enforced monotheism. Remember when I um, told you about where Muhammad was born? He was born in Mecca. In Mecca was a very, very famous um, building at that time. And it was called the Kaaba. Now, the Kaaba was a house where there was, I think it was 320 gods were worshipped. And the people of the area would come to that place and they would worship their gods. Now, when Muhammad took Mecca, he destroyed all of those gods and he made Mecca the center of monotheism, the worship of Allah alone. Monotheism is a great improvement, right? Um, t going from all of that polytheism and the worship of the sun gods and moon gods, the star gods, the ground, whatever it might be. Muhammad made this the center of worship for Allah. And we're going to have a look. There's a picture at the end of this to show you what that worship looks like now. So the first pillar is the profession of faith, and it's a monotheistic confession that identifies Muhammad as the only final prophet. Second pillar is the pillar of Salat or Salah, and it's the pillar of prayer. Five times per day, uh, you may have seen even at rest stops along the highway, that's often times where it's quite visible. Um, Muslims will pray at five designated times, and they will often, if they're aware, face their prayer mats towards Mecca. Included in this is also um, going to pray at the Friday congregational service. Uh, their day to meet together is not Sundays. Their day to meet together as Muslims is Fridays. We used to have one across the road from us in a previous house that we lived at. And every Friday people would gather together 
for worship. Interestingly, they say um, it's good to pray by yourself and every Muslim is to have an individual relationship with God, but that doesn't substitute the need for coming together to pray together as a congregation. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Profession of faith, prayer. Number three is alms. And this one might be a bit um, attractive for Christians and Jews. Alms is also called zakat, and it's talking about giving back to those who are needy. Let me read to you from the Saudi Arabian Embassy website in Washington, D.C. They say this, Zakat prescribes payment of fixed proportions of a Muslim's possessions for the welfare of the entire community and in part for its neediest members. It is equal to 2.5% of an individual's total net worth excluding obligations and family expenses. You see why it might be a bit attractive for Christians and Muslims? Oh, sorry, for Christians and Jews. 2.5%. <laughs> uh, and often that's given as an annual um, gift. Fourth is called fasting, a psalm. Um, and the feast is called the fasting Feast. That sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? But I'll explain to you why that's the case. It's called Ramadan. And that ended only at the start of last week. So Ramadan has just come to a close. And there is a feast at the end of Ramadan, which ended just last Wednesday. So it's pretty fresh in the mind of Australian and worldwide Muslims. The idea behind fasting is abstention from eating, drinking and other sensual pleasures. It is obligatory from dawn to sunset. So Ramadan is a daily fast, but an evening feast. So you'll see a daily fast, but then it's a, it's a celebration time at night time where people come together and they still feast, but they fast during the day. And then the fifth and final pillar of Islam is pilgrimage or the Hajj. These are all the Arabic words there in brackets. And they say this, in performing the Hajj, a pilgrim follows the order of ritual that the Prophet Muhammad performed during his last pilgrimage. So it follows the area that Muhammad traveled through in his last pilgrimage. And um, Mecca is the, the place where the pilgrimage is towards. This is their final destination. And there's a picture of it. That's the Hajj. This is the world's biggest mosque all around here. And you can probably see that all those white things are people all the way. You can see it all the way down the street down here. Um, the population of Mecca swells by about 2 million people every Hajj, which would be a logistical nightmare <laughs> to try and manage. Um, but if you can see uh, down here, see that black cube? In the center, the word for cube in Arabic is Kaaba. So the Kaaba stone is this stone that's inside this cube. And it's this cube that is the center of the Hajj. So people work their way inside and then they circle the Hajj. You will see it. There's just this sort of swarming mass that goes around the Kaaba stone in the middle. And so this is part of the five pillars of Islam and every able person is to perform all five of those in their lifetime. So if you know a Muslim person, then uh, at some stage in their life, they will be obliged to perform the pilgrimage in addition to all of those other regular things. I thought we should finish by reading some verses from Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And we'll read verses 6 to 9. I'm sure you'll get where I'm headed. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, I marvel... 
that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There are some who would preach Christ differently, change the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. We're going to go through and look at Islam in relation to the scriptures next time. But you can see that based upon what Muslims believe and based upon what the New Testament says, you can't be both. Because the New Testament would call a Muslim accursed and a Muslim would call a Christian an infidel, accursed. There has to be one truth. They can't both be right. And this is the error of so many people who try and say, well, you know, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, everyone's just generally believing similar things. They've just got a different way of doing it. No, 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 no. It's not true. <laughs> if you actually take the time to look at any of these beliefs, they are incompatible. They are exclusive and you have to choose. You can't just take them all. The critical thing is looking at them and seeing which one is the truth. Well, next time we get together, we're going to have a look at that and see if there's anything about the nature of these religions that might indicate which one might be re revealing what God wanted us to truly know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can take the time uh, to look into these things, Father, and we know, Lord, that um, many people People, whether they be Muslims or whether they be uh, atheists, uh, often point to the disagreements between the religions of the world or the religious fighting within religions and say, this is why I will never believe because religious people can't get along. Or religious people can't make up their minds. There's so many different things. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to just see the truth, Lord, that religion is not good enough. Um, we have to find truth. And I pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, to, to want to know, Lord, uh, that we might be able to speak to people and just look for opportunities, Lord, where we might reach the world for Christ. Uh, we ask that, Lord, you would bless our time now as we change gears and come before you in prayer. And we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.